You're listening to Audiology. Support our work on Patreon and be sure to submit your requests for topics in the comments below. The initial confrontations of the American Revolutionary War occurred with the Battles of Lexington and Concord on April 19, 1775, in the province of Massachusetts Bay, specifically within Lexington, Concord, and several surrounding towns. They signified the beginning of armed conflict between Great Britain and the American colonies. Colonial resistance increased after the British Parliament changed the Massachusetts government in retaliation for the Boston Tea Party. The colonists formed their own temporary government, the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, and organized local militia in anticipation of conflict, effectively taking control of the colony outside the British stronghold of Boston. In response, the British declared Massachusetts in a state of rebellion at the start of 1775. A secret British mission, led by Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith, was aimed at capturing and destroying the military supplies that the Massachusetts militia had stored in Concord. Patriot leaders, warned by their intelligence network, which included information provided by riders such as Paul Revere and Samuel Prescott, had already secured much of the material. Paul Revere's famous ride was set off by a signal using lanterns from Boston's Old North Church, indicating the path of the British troops. One if by land, two if by sea. The initial skirmish took place at dawn in Lexington, where eight militia members, including Ensign Robert Monroe, were killed, with the British sustaining a single injury. Outnumbered, the militia withdrew, allowing the British to proceed to Concord. There, at the North Bridge, the militia engaged with the King's troops around eleven in the morning, incurring losses on both sides and compelling the British to retreat. On their route back to Boston, the British troops encountered an increasing number of American militiamen and engaged in skirmishes all along their way back. Lieutenant Colonel Smith's forces, augmented by reinforcements under the command of Brigadier General Hugh Percy, managed to pull back under continuous pressure from the colonial forces, ultimately reaching the relative safety of Charlestown. Subsequently, the Patriots began the siege of Boston by blocking the land routes into the city. The historical importance of the Patriots' first shot at the North Bridge was poetically captured by Ralph Waldo Emerson when he referred to it as the shot heard round the world in his Concord Hymn. Contrary to what its name might imply, the confrontation at Lexington was actually a minor skirmish as opposed to a significant battle. At dawn on April 19, 1775, British Major John Pitcairn's troops marched into Lexington, where they were met by approximately 80 local militiamen positioned on the town common, with a crowd of 40 to 100 onlookers nearby. These militiamen were led by Captain John Parker, a seasoned veteran afflicted with tuberculosis, making his speech sometimes difficult to discern. The roll call of the militiamen was notable for the recurrence of several family names, including nine individuals named Harrington and seven named Monroe, one of whom was the orderly sergeant, William Monroe, with a quarter of the men being related to Captain Parker. This militia, known as a training band, was an organized unit with historical roots in Puritan times, distinct from the specialized Minutemen. Captain Parker had spent a tense night anticipating a British advance following Paul Revere's warning. Around 4.15 in the morning, the militiamen received confirmation from the scout Thaddeus Bowman that British forces were indeed approaching, and in substantial numbers. Aware of their inferior strength, Parker was reluctant to engage in a pointless fight, especially since he knew most of the supplies the British sought in Concord had already been secured. With the formal onset of war still more than a year away, he expected the British to march to Concord, find nothing, and retreat to Boston. Hence, Parker's strategic decision was to display a political and military stance without obstructing the road to Concord. Decades later, a survivor would recall Parker's directive, now commemorated at the battle site. Stand your ground. Don't fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. Parker himself stated in his sworn testimony post-battle that he had ordered his militia not to engage with the regulars unless provoked, but to disperse when they approached. A command followed before the British troops opened fire, killing eight militiamen without provocation. Amidst the unfolding chaos, Marine Lieutenant Jesse Adair, without orders, made the decision to move to the right, leading his men onto the common, trying to envelop and disarm the Lexington militia. Shortly after, 
Major Pitcairn arrived from behind the advance guard and brought his three companies to a halt on the left while Colonel Smith's companies were further along the road. On the morning of an uncertain date, a situation unfolded in Lexington, where a British officer, who was thought to possibly be either Pitcairn or Lieutenant William Sutherland, confronted a group of local militia. The officer demanded that the militia disband, and some reports suggest he called them damned rebels. Despite Captain Parker's instructions for his militia to disperse, the command was not clearly heard due to his weak voice and the commotion around them. This led to slow and disorderly movement, with no weapons being laid down. As tensions rose, a mysterious shot rang out from an undetermined source, despite orders from both sides not to fire. This incident is famously ambiguous, with no consensus on who fired first. Some have suggested a certain Solomon Brown might have been responsible, but that theory has lost credibility. Historian David Hackett Fisher posited that there could have been several shots fired simultaneously. Historian Mark Urban gives an account where the British soldiers, upon seeing the Americans disarming and leaving the field, were agitated by past grievances and impulsively rushed forward, leading to a chaotic exchange of gunfire. The British troops fired without orders, according to some witnesses, initially leading some militia members to believe they were facing only gunpowder until injuries indicated otherwise. A group of 35 Lexington witnesses, including Nathaniel Mulliken and Philip Russell, later declared that their militia had not fired first and only retaliated when the British troops unexpectedly opened fire. This conflict resulted in the deaths of eight Lexington men, John Brown, Samuel Hadley, Caleb Harrington, Jonathan Harrington, who notably died after reaching his own doorstep, Robert Monroe, Isaac Muzzy, Asahel Porter, and Jonas Parker. The British forces had one soldier wounded. The disarray among Pitcairn's forces was attributed to them not being fully briefed on the day's mission. Colonel Smith, who arrived later, restored order, and after a victory volley fired by the light infantry, the troops continued their march towards Concord. The local Concord and Lincoln militiamen gathered in Concord upon hearing of conflict in Lexington. They debated whether to wait for reinforcements, defend their town, or confront the British army on better ground. Choosing to advance toward Lexington, they encountered the British forces, but being outnumbered, they fell back to a ridge over Concord. Colonel James Barrett then led the militia further from town to a hill one mile north for a strategic vantage point. Minutemen reinforcements made their way there too. British troops under Lieutenant Colonel Smith's command split to complete General Gage's directives once reaching Concord. The South Bridge was taken by the 10th Regiment under Captain Mundy Pole, while the North Bridge was held by Captain Parsons Light Infantry. Parsons' men went to check Barrett's farm for military stores based on intelligence reports. Captain Walter Lorry, left in command at the bridge, felt vulnerable with the growing militia numbers and requested more soldiers. While searching the village, British grenadiers found cannons at Ephraim Jones's tavern, which could have been used against Boston fortifications due to their size. They rendered the cannons unusable and also destroyed some gun carriages, causing a fire that almost spread to the meeting house, though Martha Moulton convinced the soldiers to help extinguish it. They also discarded food and musket balls into a pond, which locals later reclaimed. Generally, British soldiers behaved properly, paying for provisions and inadvertently being led away from other militia supplies. Barrett's farm, which previously held a sizable arsenal, had been nearly cleared by the time British troops arrived. According to family lore, any remaining weapons were concealed among ploughed fields. The searching soldiers found little of importance. As Colonel Barrett's troops observed the smoke billowing from the village centre where British forces were burning cannon carriages, they spotted just a small cluster of British light infantry. Deciding to take a stand, Barrett's men moved from their lookout point on Punkatasset Hill to a nearer elevation approximately 274 metres from North Bridge. The scene grew tense as reinforcements swelled the colonial ranks to at least 400 men, hailing from Acton, Concord, Bedford and Lincoln, ready to confront the approximately 90 to 95 British soldiers under Captain Laurie's command. Barrett commanded his Massachusetts contingent to form a double-file line leading to the bridge and sought advice from his officers. 
including Lieutenant Colonel John Robinson from Westford. When Barrett asked Captain Isaac Davis of Acton if his men would spearhead the attack, Davis bravely committed, saying, I'm not afraid to go, and I haven't a man that's afraid to go. Following orders to load their weapons but hold fire unless fired upon, the militiamen advanced towards North Bridge. Amidst this tension, Lorry's tactical blunder saw his troops attempt a street-firing position ill-fitted for the open terrain, causing disarray. Lieutenant Sutherland tried to rectify the situation by deploying flankers, but with little success. Confusion culminated in a shot, likely a warning from an exhausted British soldier as reported by Captain Lorry after the clash. The stray gunfire escalated as others followed suit, with the British unleashing a scattered volley that tragically claimed the lives of two Acton men, Private Abner Hosmer and Captain Davis. The deadly exchange unfolded with both sides separated by mere metres, as Reverend Dr. Ripley recalled the moment clearly. The Americans commenced their march in double file. In a minute or two, the Americans being in quick motion and within ten or fifteen rods of the bridge, a single gun was fired by a British soldier, which marked the route, passing under Colonel Robinson's arm and slightly wounding the side of Luther Blanchard, a fifer, in the Acton Company. The colonists responded to Major Buttrick's command to Fire for God's sake, fellow soldiers. Fire, inflicting casualties and wounding four of the eight British officers and sergeants leading the front lines. The British suffered fatalities and several wounded in the ensuing melee. As Reverend and Minuteman Joseph Thaxter, who witnessed the event, later described, I was an eyewitness to the following facts. The people of Westford and Acton, and some few of Concord, were the first who faced the British at Concord Bridge. When they advanced about halfway on the causeway, the British fired one gun, a second, a third, and then the whole body. They killed Colonel Davis of Acton and a Mr. Hosmer. Our people then fired over one another's heads. They killed two and wounded eleven. With the tide turned, the overwhelmed British retreated, harassed by the Americans. Bereft of effective leadership and vastly outnumbered, the British soldiers abandoned their wounded and fled to meet reinforcements leaving behind Captain Parsons and his men, who had been searching for arms at Barrett's farm. The battle signified a pivotal moment in the opening chapter of the American Revolution, illustrating the colonists' resolve and courage in the face of British military might. The reaction of the settlers to their unexpected triumph in the skirmish was one of surprise, as it was largely unforeseen that either side would actually resort to lethal force against the other. While some pressed on, many withdrew and others departed to ensure the well-being of their households. Colonel Barrett worked to re-establish his command, redistributing some of his forces to a nearby hilltop and dispatching Major Buttrick and additional troops to secure a position behind a stone wall on another hill. At the same time, Lieutenant Colonel Smith from the British side was alerted to the confrontation and the plea for backup from Lorry. Promptly organising two companies of his grenadiers, Smith embarked toward the North Bridge, only to encounter the beaten light infantry companies fleeing in his direction. Realising the vulnerability of the four companies at Barrett's farm due to the unprotected return path, an apprehensive Smith proceeded cautiously with just his officers to survey the Minutemen, who had taken up positions behind a stone wall in the distance. One colonial soldier noted the British officers' vulnerability, saying that they could have been easily picked off had they been given the order to shoot but no such command was given. In the midst of this intense impasse, which lasted around ten minutes, a local man with mental illness named Elias Brown made his way between both parties, selling hard cider in an unlikely interlude. Afterward, the British detachment that had unsuccessfully scoured Barrett's farm treaded back through what had become a silent battlefield, observing their fallen and injured compatriots, including one who appeared to have been scalped, a sight that deeply upset and incensed them. They traversed the bridge, reaching the town by 11.30 in the morning, and remained under the observant gaze of the colonial militia maintaining their defences. The British continued with their mission to locate and annihilate rebel military stockpiles in the town, took a pause for lunch, regrouped, and finally commenced their march out of Concord after midday. This lag in departure unwittingly allowed for more colonial militiamen from neighbouring towns to converge on the path leading back to Boston. 
Note. The original statement did not contain any explicit numbers, abbreviations, or spoken punctuation that needed to be converted into a fully verbalized version. Ambiguous references have been retained as they are inherent to the historical context and narrative style. Lieutenant Colonel Smith took precautions for the safety of his troops by deploying flank units along a ridge to shield his men from approximately 1,000 colonial soldiers who appeared in the fields as the British force moved eastward from Concord. The ridge led to Miriam's Corner, a crossroads located a mile from Concord where the main road intersected with a bridge over Elm Brook. At this narrow bridge, the British had to regroup into a tight formation to cross, exposing them to a larger gathering of colonial militia. When the British reached the end of the bridge, their rear guard turned and fired upon the nearby colonials, who, until then, had been ineffectively engaging at a distance. The militia responded with lethal accuracy, resulting in the deaths and injuries of several British soldiers without suffering any colonial losses. Once across, Lieutenant Colonel Smith promptly readjusted his flank units for defence. Around a mile past Miriam's Corner, at Brooks Hill, nearly 500 militiamen waited to ambush the British from an elevated position, leading to a confrontation that caused substantial British casualties. Smith's men had to retreat from Brooks Hill, pushing on to reach Brooks Tavern, where they encountered intensified attacks from more militia groups. Further down the road, at a spot now called the Bloody Angle, the British were caught in a crossfire, with militia positioned advantageously to attack from several directions. As the British forces progressed through the hazardous curves in the road, they suffered significant losses, both in terms of men killed or wounded and in their overall operational capacity. Despite these setbacks, militia support continued to grow, swelling to around 2,000 men. As the British approached the Lexington border, they were ambushed again, this time by Captain John Parker's men. During this skirmish, Lieutenant Colonel Smith was wounded, leaving Major John Pitcairn to lead. Despite injuries to both leaders, the British managed to push through, albeit in a more chaotic and vulnerable state. As the beleaguered British forces neared Lexington Centre, they were fortunate to be met by reinforcements under Earl Percy, complete with artillery support. These reinforcements were crucial for the British withdrawal. The battle-worn British had been in motion since the early morning hours, and were close to surrender when relief arrived around 2.30pm Reverend Joseph Thaxter, a Westford Minuteman, noted in his recollection that if not for Percy's timely aid, the British would likely have had to surrender given their exhaustion and the intense colonial pursuit. British officers and soldiers would later express their irritation with colonial tactics. The militia used cover effectively, utilising trees and stone walls for guerrilla-style attacks, contrary to the British expectation of open linear battle formations. This American propensity for unconventional tactics was not only effective but became a legendary component of their fighting spirit, with militiamen depicted as tenacious individuals fighting under their own volition. Earl Percy recognised the effectiveness of the American tactics, acknowledging the militiamen's resilience and strategic use of the terrain. The colonials, he observed, wisely refrained from forming large groups, instead attacking in a scattered but persistent fashion, well suited to their knowledge of the land and their previous experiences in North American conflicts. In preparation for the possibility that Lieutenant Colonel Smith's mission might need additional troops, General Gage had crafted orders for backup forces to gather in Boston early at 4 a.m. Gage was so intent on keeping the operation under wraps that he had only one set of orders delivered to the adjutant of the 1st Brigade. However, due to negligence, these orders were accidentally left out on a table by the adjutant's servant. Around this time, Lieutenant Colonel Smith was getting close to Lexington, just three miles away at 4 a.m., and realised that the element of surprise was compromised as the local communities were already alert to their presence. Responding to the situation, Smith sent a messenger back to Boston asking for more soldiers. When the messenger got to Boston at around 5 a.m., the call was made to pull together the 1st Brigade, which included specific infantry companies and a battalion of Royal Marines, all under Earl Percy's command. However, due to procedural repetition, Individual commanders were again only given a single set of instructions, leading to a mishap where the Royal Marines order ended up on Major John Pitcairn's desk, who was not present given he was already at Lexington with Smith. After these hold-ups, Percy's force, 
about a thousand strong, didn't set off from Boston until around 8.45 a.m., heading for Lexington. It's said that they paraded to the mocking melody of Yankee Doodle, a tune that was to be embraced by the colonial forces as an anthem by the time of the Battle of Bunker Hill a couple of months later. Percy and his men took the road over Boston Neck and the Great Bridge, which local colonists had partly dismantled to thwart their passage. On their way, they naively received directions to Lexington from a disengaged Harvard tutor, who was later forced to flee the country for unwittingly aiding the British. Percy's brigade made it to Lexington around 2 p.m., right as the sound of battle was audible from afar. They immediately positioned their cannon and set out lines of soldiers on high ground, which allowed them a superior view over the township. Colonel Smith's troops arrived in disarray, chased down by the colonial militia. Percy commanded the artillery to launch long-range fire, effectively dispersing the militia and providing reprieve for Smith's worn-out soldiers. Contrary to the counsel of his Master of Ordnance, Percy hadn't brought extra ammunition for his brigade or the two artillery pieces, under the impression that excess wagons would just slow them down. His men were limited to 36 rounds each, and the artillery had just a handful of ammunition rounds in their side boxes. After Percy had already departed, Gage sent two ammunition wagons with an escort of one officer and thirteen men to catch up. On their route, they encountered an ambush by elderly militiamen, veterans who were past the age of active militia duty. With a bold move, these veterans demanded the wagons surrender. When the regulars tried to push through, the militiamen attacked, downing the lead horses, killing two sergeants and wounding the officer. The British surrendered after a brief skirmish, with some discarding their arms into a nearby pond before being captured. Percy took command over approximately 1,700 men, offering them a chance to recuperate and receive medical attention at Monroe Tavern, their temporary headquarters. After regrouping, they departed Lexington around 3.30 p.m., adopting a defensive formation to safeguard the column's flanks and rear. The wounded were transported on cannons, having to get down whenever the militia attacked. Percy's men, although encircled, had the strategic benefit of being able to quickly maneuver forces internally. Percy strategically positioned Smith's troops in the center and utilized the 23rd Regiment's line companies to protect the rear. He adapted to the American tactics, rotating his rear guard about every mile to provide his men with rest, dispatched flank companies on either side, and used a strong detachment of Marines at the front to clear the way. During the pause at Lexington, Brigadier General William Heath took over Colonial Militia Command, having earlier discussed strategies with Joseph Warren and the Massachusetts Committee of Safety in Watertown. Heath and Warren instructed their men to scatter, forming a loose ring around Percy's troops and utilizing skirmish tactics instead of facing the British artillery directly. Militiamen employed hit-and-run assaults, shooting from afar with muskets which had an effective range of 50 yards before retreating and re-engaging. Heath directed incoming militia to strategic positions for this guerrilla warfare, and ensured supplies were available to support them. The leadership of Heath and Warren was instrumental in the militia's effective resistance. The conflict escalated near monotony as newly arrived, militia intensified their fire upon the British, and locals, including marksmen concealed in homes, fought back fiercely. Jason Russell made a stand at his home, uttering the famous words, an Englishman's home is his castle, before dying at his doorstep. His residence, marked by bullet holes, remains a testament to the battle. An ambush from his orchard failed, resulting in the deaths of eleven militiamen. Percy's command diminished as his men sought reprisal for prior events, including rumoured atrocities at North Bridge, by targeting residents hiding in structures within settled areas. The infuriated and weary regulars, difficult to restrain for junior officers, committed violence and plundered, fueled in part by alcohol taken from local taverns. This included the killing of innocents and theft of a church's silver, which was later recovered. Notably, Samuel Whittemore, an elderly monotony resident, displayed remarkable resilience by killing three soldiers before being severely injured and left for dead, to later surprisingly recover and live until 1793. The encounter in Monotomy and Cambridge witnessed the greatest bloodshed of the day, with the casualties being approximately 25 colonial militia and a combined 120 British killed and wounded,
with the 47th Foot and Marines bearing a significant share of the British losses. British forces engaged in more ferocious combat as they advanced into Cambridge, passing the Monotomy River, which is currently known as Alewife Brook. The arriving militias, now adopting a tighter formation, suffered significant casualties at the hands of General Percy's troops, who utilised artillery and strategic positioning at Watson's Corner. Earlier on, the dismantling of the Great Bridge on the orders of General Heath posed an obstacle to Percy's brigade. However, Percy cleverly rerouted his men via a path less expected, presently known as Beach Street in the vicinity of Porter Square, which threw off the American militias numbering around 4,000. Although they tried to encircle Percy's forces with gunfire, the manoeuvre disrupted their efforts. As the British neared a destroyed bridge with militias waiting, Percy's decision to detour prevented an entrapment. American forces attempted to seize control over Prospect Hill, a tactically advantageous location in what is now Somerville, but were ultimately driven away by Percy with his last ammunition reserves. Meanwhile, a sizable force of militias from Salem and Marblehead had the opportunity to intercept Percy on his way to Charlestown, but held back on Winter Hill, allowing the British a clear escape path. Allegations arose against Colonel Timothy Pickering, the leader of this force, suggesting that he might have let the British pass to prevent exacerbating the conflict. Although Pickering later justified his inaction by claiming he was following Heath's commands, Heath himself refuted such claims. The British troops managed to withstand a final onslaught as they retreated to Charlestown, thanks to the defence mounted by Pitcairn's marines. After an exhausting two days without rest, covering a march of forty miles in twenty-one hours, eight hours of which were under attack, the weary soldiers finally found respite upon reaching the heights of Charlestown. They were further reinforced by fresh forces from the 10th and 64th regiments, as well as the protective artillery of HMS Somerset. Plans to construct fortifications in Charlestown began, but were never completed. These initial efforts laid the groundwork for what would become militia fortifications two months later in the lead-up to the Battle of Bunker Hill. Surveying the positioning of British forces, General Heath opted to call back the American militias to Cambridge, recognising the strategic advantage held by the British with their newly secured position on the hills of Charlestown. In the morning hours, the city of Boston found itself encircled by a formidable force of over 15,000 militia members from across New England. This military presence was in contrast to the earlier powder alarm, as this time the stories of bloodshed were indeed true, marking the onset of the Revolutionary War. The command had now transitioned to General Artemis Ward, who took charge on April 20th, succeeding Brigadier General William Heath. These forces established a siege stretching from Chelsea and circling the peninsulas of Boston and Charlestown to Roxbury, effectively trapping Boston on three fronts. Following these events, additional militias from New Hampshire, Rhode Island and Connecticut converged, bolstering the colonial presence. It was then, during the Second Continental Congress, that these troops were absorbed into what would become the Continental Army. Even after warfare commenced, General Gage declined to enforce martial law in Boston. By negotiating with the local officials, he secured the surrender of privately held arms in exchange for permitting residents to leave the city. The battle, while not particularly dramatic in terms of strategy or the number of casualties incurred, represented a critical blunder relative to the British political intentions of the intolerable acts and their military tactics seen in the powder alarms. Far from achieving its goal, the confrontation only spurred on the conflict it meant to quell and achieved little in terms of arms confiscation. In the immediate post-battle period, a campaign unfolded for British public opinion. Just four days later, the Massachusetts Provincial Congress had gathered numerous eyewitness accounts from militiamen and captured British soldiers. Anticipating General Gage's official report to London, they dispatched a collection of these accounts via a quicker vessel. Delivered to an amiable official, these narratives hit the London press a full two weeks ahead of Gage's account, which was criticised for its lack of detail and failed to sway public perspective. Figures such as George Germain, typically unsympathetic to the colonists, conceded that the Bostonians are in the right to make the king's troops the aggressors and claim a victory. In examining the causes of the confrontation, British politicians largely faulted Gage rather than their policies. Within the British camp in Boston, 
fingers were pointed at both General Gage and Colonel Smith for the setbacks at Lexington and Concord. The day following the skirmish, John Adams journeyed from his Braintree home across the battlefields, feeling certain that a pivotal moment had passed, expressing the die was cast, the Rubicon crossed. In Philadelphia, Thomas Paine shifted his view of the colonial dispute from a mere lawsuit to a definitive rejection of the obstinate English monarchy after hearing of the battle. George Washington, upon receiving the news at Mount Vernon, lamented to a confidant that America's peaceful lands faced a grim future, soaked in blood or overrun by tyranny, an untenable choice for any honorable individual. Even on the far frontier, the impact of these events was felt, with a band of hunters naming their site Lexington upon hearing of the clash, which would lay the foundations for the future city of Lexington, Kentucky. The fledgling American government was keen to craft a narrative of British aggression and American victimhood during the outset of the Revolutionary War, particularly regarding the initial conflict. Details about the Patriots' strategic preparations, intelligence gathering, and the signaling systems employed were not openly discussed for many years. Additionally, incidents such as the attack on a disabled British soldier at North Bridge were deliberately downplayed, with records of such actions like depositions being withheld from public knowledge or even returned to those who gave them, as was the case with Paul Revere. Art of the time depicted the clash at Lexington as a one-sided massacre. Through time, recollections of the events at Lexington and Concord evolved, with former uncertain testimonies solidifying into a unified claim that the British had fired the first shot at Lexington. Accounts of the skirmish shifted. By the 19th century, Painting started to show the colonial militia fighting back valiantly instead of merely being unjustly attacked. Ralph Waldo Emerson, in his famous 1837 Concord Hymn, enshrined the episode at North Bridge, commemorating the revolution's beginnings and influencing the country's understanding of its past. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem, Paul Revere's Ride, despite its historical inaccuracies, was memorized by generations of schoolchildren and painted Revere as a historical changemaker. Opinions on these historic events shifted with the political tides throughout the 20th century. Prior to both world wars, a growing isolationist stance cast doubt on Revere's role. On the other hand, during periods of strong British-American relations, more nuanced interpretations emerged. At some points, such as during the Espionage Act of 1917, interpretations could be seen as so contentious that they were even subject to government action. The Lexington Battle Green, the site of the initial conflict, is now a national historic landmark featuring several memorials. The area around North Bridge in Concord, along with a stretch of the route between there and Lexington, forms part of the Minuteman National Historical Park. The park features trails with educational displays and is staffed with guides, sometimes in historical dress, who elucidate the history of the place. The park also contains a bronze bas-relief of Major Buttrick and the iconic Minuteman statue by Daniel Chester French. The American Battlefield Trust has worked to conserve land at the site of the battle. Units of the Massachusetts National Guard today trace their lineage back to the American units that fought in the battles of Lexington and Concord, underscoring the event's enduring military legacy. Moreover, the U.S. Navy has named several vessels including two World War II aircraft carriers, in honor of the Battle of Lexington, reflecting the battle's significance and legacy within American history.